Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope all of you are having fantastic Thursdays, wherever you may be across this great country or this great land. I am on the Giants at the 49ers over 43 and a half tonight. Thursday night football. We're into week three of NFL action. I'm on the over 43 and a half. Uh, We went five and three last week. Uh, and uh, here's my outkick six-pack. Let me give you a roadmap where we're headed, by the way. Uh, Portnoy versus the Washington Post. I've got some uh, some opinions. Uh, Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, southern border disaster. Is no one going to challenge Biden? And Rupert Murdoch, media icon, steps down from Fox and News Corp. I will discuss all of that. But first, I will make you all very rich. Thanks to... The Outkick Six Pack. Uh, I just gave you the over 43 and a half tonight. Also, Titans plus three and a half at the Browns. I like two picks here Chargers at Vikings. Vikings minus one and a half. By the way, these numbers are as of uh, 45 minutes ago. Uh, Chargers at Vikings minus one and a half. And the over 53 and a half. Uh, Patriots at Jets, the under 36 and a half. Saints, Packers, minus one and a half. I'm on the Packers. Broncos at Dolphins, minus six and a half. And the one that'll either make me look like a genius or an imbecile. I'm on the Cardinals, plus 12 and a half against the Cowboys uh, this weekend in Arizona. So, bunch of picks. Let me hit them one more time. These will be up on OutKick later this afternoon. Giants at 49ers, the over 43 and a half. Titans plus three and a half at the Browns. Chargers at Vikings minus one and a half. The over 53 and a half. Pats Jets the under 36 and a half. Saints at Packers minus one and a half. Broncos at Dolphins minus six and a half. And the Cowboys at the Cardinals plus 12 and a half. Okay, those are all of my NFL gambling picks. I want to talk for a minute. I think 30 million people have watched this thing. Uh, The Washington Post a food reporter, they were double-teaming. I don't know why you need two food reporters to write one article, but and also food reporter, like, hey, how about go write about whether you like somebody's pasta or not, uh, or go review a restaurant, or go write about a new food. So look, uh, Dave and I, those of you who followed it over the years, have sniped back and forth a few times, but I saw this, I thought he did a great job um, with the video that he posted. What we have entered into, and some of you may have remembered reading when the Washington Post did a profile of me and I had to write all, uh, share the entire audio transcript of our conversation uh, to, uh, to put it in larger context. They misquoted me. I taped the whole thing. I went and looked. They were taking like half sentences. They were taking uh, not full comments. And I posted, I recorded the entire thing. And then I posted the transcript and they had to edit it, go back and correct it because they had misquoted me. Um, If I hadn't taped the whole thing, nobody would know. So, Dave, they're doing a story about his pizza festival. Let me just start here. It's a pizza festival, all right? Like, if I'm going to go speak at a political rally and it were sponsored by, I don't know, uh, you know, like uh, Heineken, if I'm speaking at a political rally and then Heineken's got a big banner behind me, I can see them calling and being like, hey, does Heineken really want to be a... you people are losers, right? If you have ever thought to yourself, I want to write an article asking whether somebody wants to be associated with somebody else, get a flipping life. I, I mean, seriously. But if it's a pizza festival, why do you need to write an article uh, alleging that somebody's misogynistic or racist or whatever it is when they're throwing a pizza festival? It's a freaking pizza festival. The Washington Post is covering Dave Portnoy's pizza festival more aggressively than they've covered Joe Biden's criminal behavior with Hunter Biden. They've got two writers on it. They need to double team a story about a pizza festival. The guy throwing a pizza festival has a two. I mean, this is crazy. So what he did, though, was let you see how the sausage is made. These people are not actual journalists. An actual journalist would maybe go to the pizza festival and take footage of people at the pizza festival and write and or talk about the pizza festival itself. They would see a news event happening to the extent that you consider a pizza festival to be a news event in the first place, which I really don't. 
I mean, are most food festivals news stories? But if you're a food reporter, hey, we're going to go to the pizza festival. We're going to review some pizza. We're going to talk to some people there and see what they thought of the pizza festival. All right, that would be, I probably would never read that. But if you're a food reporter, that's fine. What they're trying to do is what I have seen happen to anybody who doesn't have left-wing views for the last 25 years. They try to go after the advertisers of anybody who is not left-wing and cut the legs out from underneath them by getting advertisers to abandon association with products for fear of articles that are going to be written. This is a form of uh, blackmail, right? They are trying to intimidate the advertisers from being associated with a guy whose opinions they don't like. I see this all the time, right? Uh, it's one reason I found it out kick because I was like, Hey, I don't want to have to worry about all the time going out and selling advertisements and everything else, or worry about what some boss of mine is going to think about some article that they wrote. Cause somebody doesn't like my opinion. These are left wing activists masquerading as journalists. And they are trying to use the power of the Washington post to try and cut the legs out from underneath of Dave Portnoy in a pizza festival. It's not just about the pizza festival. They want every advertiser, I guarantee you, that is associated with Barstool not to be working with Barstool because they don't like some of the content that Barstool puts out or some of the comments that Dave Portnoy makes. That's why you have to put these people on blast. That's why you have to expose them. That's why you have to let so many people out there understand what they are really doing. That's what I wrote about in this book. I said, look, they're in the subscription business. That's what the Washington Post is now. That's what the New York Times is. It used to be they were in the news business. And when you were in the news business, you primarily sold advertising. Now they're in the subscription business. Who subscribes to something? People who really like a, uh, really like a product or a direction, Right. The newspaper, a lot of people don't understand this, but I do think it's important for understanding the news business. The newspaper used to make all of its money primarily off of advertising. Now, you had to pay for a newspaper subscription, but it was primarily to cover the cost of print and to cover the cost of delivery. They don't actually make a huge profit off of, back in the day, delivering the newspaper to your home. Where they made the profit was off the ads and also off the classified ads, which is why... Uh, which is why Craigslist just totally did away with uh, the classified. Classified used to be the most popular, uh, most profitable part of the newspaper. If you ever bought a puppy, you ever bought a car, you ever looked for an apartment back in the 80s and 90s, you know what I'm talking about. You had to go get the local classified newspaper, go through, look at that, uh, look at that, circle things, call people, figure out how to buy something. Okay. They would have given you the newspaper for free if they knew you would read it because that allowed them to charge more money for uh, their (coughs) advertisers and for the classified ads. But then the internet came along and now the new model is not really advertiser based anymore because you can't make that much money off advertising. Not to build a, uh, a, a, you know, a billion dollar company, which I'm sure the Washington Post uh, wants to be. Okay. So, So if you go look at this and analyze it, they are now a subscription business. And they're in the subscription business of doing what? Serving left-wing subscribers. They are basically a modern-day rival site 24-7 on three. If you're a college football fan like I am, if you're a college sports fan like I am, you might well be a subscriber to one of these different individual team sites. And the analogy I make in here, and it's an important one, is do you know who never breaks negative news on their preferred team? The team sites. The team sites don't break negative news because the subscribers want to hear good things. Or at least they don't want to hear bad things. You don't want to subscribe to something that destroys something that you like. They never break news about uh, NCAA violations, right, that would otherwise not have gone public. That's not the business. That's the Washington Post and the New York Times. So what Dave did was he showed you behind the, behind the curtain, so to speak, or they showed you how the sausage is made. This is how these stories get crafted. A writer decides that he or she has an opinion that they want to put into the article. 
They write a huge portion of the article, and then at the very end, they decide, oh, we're going to throw in a couple of quotes. I don't know if the Washington Post is going to publish a story on this or not. As we sit here right now at uh, 415 East Coast, um, they may. I don't know. But what he's done is show you how dishonest these people fundamentally are. And I say this, I know a lot of people work in media, watch or listen to this. If you are being interviewed, you need to record the whole thing. I, I basically will not. If I know there's an article being written about me or somebody wants me to comment on something, I say, hey, can you email me the questions? And I basically only respond via email now. Or I have, we have a PR guy. I have our PR guy I say, hey, make sure we get this entire interview recorded so if we get treated unfairly in the way that this story is conveyed or they're misquoting me or they're taking me out of context, I want the whole thing, the record. I mean, Dave said something that I think is important. He said, I'm always on the record, basically, and I'm paraphrasing him. It's true for me, too. I do three hours of live radio. I'm live right now talking to you guys. I'm gonna, I was just live on Fox News. I'm live all day long doing media. I'm fine if people quote me what I say. I wouldn't say it publicly unless I believed it. But don't take the third sentence and try to turn it into a huge story out of a paragraph and completely miss the larger context. So I give credit. Record every interaction. Tape every interaction. Presume that you are dealing with people who are fundamentally dishonest and are not actually journalists, they are activists. And just think about the world in which we live, that the Washington Post will assign two writers to write a story about a pizza festival and try to tear down somebody, and they'll barely cover Hunter Biden and Joe Biden's criminal complicity at all. It's just... I mean, the paper of Watergate has turned into the paper of, oh my God, can you believe a pizza festival partnership is going on? I, I just, I can't believe this is, this is the world we live in. But I do think it's an illuminating and, and interesting behind the scenes look. All right, I'm fired up about this. You might have heard me talk about it uh, on Clay and Buck. Is no Democrat that has a substantial audience going to challenge Joe Biden at all? 75% of Democrat voters don't want Joe Biden to be the nominee. Huge percentages, 75% of the nation, believes that Joe Biden doesn't have the mental or physical capacity to be president. He just, according to the New York Post, did a, uh, a fundraising event where, and I can't believe this is real, because it's, again, I, I feel like I'm living in the upside down, right? Bizarro world. Joe Biden told a story about why he decided to run for president, waited a couple of minutes, then came back and told the exact same story all over again. The guy has severe dementia, okay? You could watch him. Did you see him on the stage with the Brazilian president? He forgot to shake hands with the Brazilian president. If you go and compare Joe Biden talking today to Joe Biden talking even when he ran for president in 2020, he has diminished significantly in his cognitive abilities. So if you are J.B. Pritzker, if you are Gretchen Whitmer, if you are Gavin Newsom, if you are Elizabeth Warren, if you are Jared Polis, I don't understand why someone isn't challenging Joe Biden for the Democrat nomination. Whatever happens in 24, Kamala Harris is going to be the foremost contender in 2028. In order to beat her, you're going to have to beat identity politics. The black uh, woman that is the vice president is going to be the foremost contender in 2028. I think it's easier to beat Joe Biden right now than it might be to beat Kamala Harris in 28 because in 2028, there will be 20 or more people probably running for the Democrat nomination. And Kamala Harris is going to start off with a substantial core of that support. I think it's easier to beat Joe Biden. I'm a big probabilities guy, okay? So... I can't believe there aren't conversations going on right now. When Barack Obama ran and beat Hillary Clinton, he thought he had a 20% chance of actually pulling it off. What percentage chance do you think somebody would have of beating Joe Biden if they actually ran as a viable candidate? I'm not talking about RFK Jr., who I like, or Marianne Williamson, who are kind of coming out of nowhere. I'm talking about somebody with a political infrastructure that is already a governor, a senator, a congressperson. Why would you not run against him? 
from a pure probability perspective, I think you would have a better chance of beating Joe Biden than you would of winning the nomination in 2028. There's just a much smaller cadre. Now, Biden would be a big favorite, but I think any decent Democrat candidate that challenged Biden would have like a 25% chance at least of being the nominee. Now, that's not great, but if you've got a 25% chance of being president of the United States, that's pretty impressive. So the risk-reward here to me is 100% in the favor of deciding to run against Joe Biden. Why would you not do it? You might lose. Okay, so what? I, am, am I weird in this? Maybe this is the world of sports. I, I lose all the time. The best gamblers in the world lose 47 or 40, 47% of the time, 46% of the time. If you every year could win 53% of your bets, you would end up a billionaire. 52.3% is making money. If you consistently could make 53 or 54% every year on your bets for the rest of your life, you would end up a billionaire. You lose a lot. Losing's not the worst thing. I I, I don't know. I, I, I mean... I could have never attempted anything. I could still be practicing law. I never would have lost. I wouldn't have lost $50,000 in pants. I've lost a lot over the years. Just got to get back up. It's not the worst thing. And sometimes in losing, you can see future victories because you learn. You get better. There's very few people who have ever done anything that have had consistent success. If you always win, then you aren't challenging yourself enough. You have to be willing to take risks. Sometimes you have to be willing to lose. You might lose if you run against Joe Biden. So what? You're still the governor. You're still the senator. Still the congressperson. Losing's not the worst thing that can happen. The worst thing that can happen, let me tell you, is to be so afraid to take a chance that you refuse to actually ever leave the sideline. And I feel like all the Democrats right now are afraid to leave the sideline. And as a result, Joe Biden is the worst incumbent president based on his record at the border, based on his record on crime, based on his record on inflation, based on his record of, hey, let's not have a war in Europe. Joe Biden is the worst president of any of our lives. And I just find it unbelievable that the entire Democrat Party is just going to sit back and allow Biden to take a second run at the presidency and not even challenge him at all. This guy is a shell of the candidate he was in 2020, and he wasn't a good candidate then. I just can't believe it's not going to happen. Southern border. Bill Belugin's doing incredible work for Fox News. If you're not following Bill Belugin, I would encourage you to go follow him. Over 10,000 people that we know of illegally crossed the southern border yesterday in the last 24 hours. It's likely that in the next couple of days, we're going to set an all-time record for the number of people that are crossing the southern border. Joe Biden is more concerned with the border security of Ukraine than he is the southern United States border. And you're starting to see a back backlash on a massive scale in Chicago, in New York City, in Washington, D.C., in all of these blue city, blue uh, Democrat-run strongholds, even Democrat voters are saying this is broken, and they don't have anybody else to blame for it. I keep thinking, surely they are going to fix this, and it just keeps getting worse. I want to hammer this home. The Republicans should move their third presidential primary debate to the border and force all the media that would cover that presidential primary debate to instead go to the border and cover it there. It's a no-brainer to me. That should happen, and I hope that somebody out there is listening and will make a decision like this. Uh, All right, let me talk about Rupert Murdoch for a moment. News came out this morning that Rupert Murdoch stepping down as chairman I believe he is 92 years old. Um, 
And I think Rupert Murdoch is the most successful media baron of the 20th and now 21st century uh, in my life. What he has done, whether you agree or disagree with every decision he has made, and by the way, you shouldn't agree with any decision anybody makes other than yourself 100% of the time. The New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, to a certain extent, OutKick. Without these sites and without these platforms, there would be no opposition to the mainstream media narrative in America today. As a First Amendment absolutist, think about how scary that is. As much power as we see from the Washington Post, the New York Times, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, without Fox News, without uh, the New York Post, without the Wall Street Journal, and in the world of sports and on pop culture some, without OutKick, there's no opposition. There is no opposition to left-wing hegemony in the entire country. Rupert Murdoch has been an incredible businessman, but leaving aside the business, in terms of just creating a space for a marketplace of ideas to exist, without Rupert Murdoch, there is no marketplace of ideas in America today. Now, there are other sites doing a great job. Daily Wire, for instance. I'm very impressed with those guys. Most people don't read the Daily Wire compared to the New York Post and compared to the Wall Street Journal and compared to Fox News. I hope the Daily Wire is going to grow into something bigger. Uh, The Blaze, there are lots of different companies out there that I think are doing good work. But without Rupert Murdoch, there is no functional opposition. And let me just tell you a sports-specific story that I'm surprised hasn't been written. I keep giving ideas to people. Maybe the best business deal in the history of sports so far in terms of dollars made versus dollars lost in sports is uh, just a few years ago, I believe 2018, Rupert Murdoch sold $71 billion in assets to Disney. Disney purchased those assets uh, and now has uh, you know all sorts of issues going on. I'll talk about Disney tomorrow. In fact, I need to flag that because they're now trying to get out of politics because their business has taken so many body blows. But I want to focus in particular in the middle of that $71 billion were regional sports networks. The regional sports networks, this is like Fox Sports Ohio, Fox Sports South, you know what I'm talking about. All of those, they later were rebranded as Bally's. Rupert Murdoch sold those to Disney for around $20 billion. Okay, $20 billion, just a few years ago. Uh, And then the Department of Justice said, hey, Disney you aren't allowed to own all of these regional sports networks because of the power and reach of ESPN. You have to sell them. And I believe Disney sold them for around $13 billion, something in that neighborhood. In fact, let me look up what what did Bally's pay for the RSNs because I want to make sure I get that right. Um, So I'm going to type this in right now. uh, And let's see if I can get that dollar figure to come up. Um, so Bally's, uh, Bally's buys all these regional sports networks from Disney. Um, and, uh, let's see if I can get, um, the official dollar figure. I'm actually looking at ESPN right now. Let's see if ESPN will, uh, will even report it. I think it was around $12 billion. Uh, again, they bought them from Disney when they were forced to be able to, uh, to purchase them. Uh, they've now gone bankrupt. So, in the space of a few years, uh, okay, they, they sold them nearly $10 billion. Sinclair bought them for nearly $10 billion. So, think about this. In 2018, Rupert Murdoch sold the regional sports networks for $20 billion. Disney had to turn around and sell them and immediately lost $10 billion on that transaction. So, Sinclair buys them for $10 billion dollars They now have gone bankrupt. So in the space of five years, Rupert Murdoch got $20 billion for an asset that now has a value right now of zero because of all the debt 
and all the money that's been lost. Disney immediately lost $10 billion, and now Sinclair has lost $10 billion. He got $20 billion for them. He stepped off the cable and satellite bundle at the absolute most opportune moment, and he got paid at an apex value right as the value went to zero. He got a $20 billion value uh, for something that five years later was worth nothing. The sing- I, I really believe this. The single greatest exit in sports business history, $20 billion for an asset five years later that would be worth zero. Uh, Rupert Murdoch is a legend. Regardless of what your politics are, purely from a business perspective, whether it's starting the Fox Network, whether it's starting Fox News, buying the Wall Street Journal, buying the New York Post, and I'm not even focused on the Times of London uh, and, uh, and all the assets in Australia and everywhere else around the world, just focused on these. It's an incredible career, one of, if not the most impressive in all of American media history. Finally, um, Taylor Swift. And Travis Kelsey, all this rumor going on, oh, Travis Taylor Swift did this, Travis Kelsey did this. Travis Kelsey said uh, on an interview I saw with Pat uh, McAfee that he saw her rock Arrowhead Stadium and now he wanted her to see him rock Arrowhead Stadium. People are like, oh, are Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift uh, dating and all this stuff? Here's the deal. Taylor Swift could do a lot better. I'm just going to be honest with you. Taylor Swift is a billionaire. She is maybe the most talented musician in American history from, from, listen, from the amount of money she is going to make. Taylor Swift is like 33 years old. She's already a billionaire. Her catalog of songs are going to be worth billions more. She's making, I think, over a billion dollars on her concert tour alone. I mean, she may, and it's not, it's not crazy. She may end up being worth one day fifty or a hundred billion dollars. No exaggeration. Just based on her catalog, continuing to work out uh, all the things, the value that she has created. I think she is the most successful musician in the history of the United States, maybe the world. Again, not making a values judgment on the song, just based on the value of the uh, the product that she has unlocked. Why does she want to be with Travis Kelsey? Look, Travis Kelsey's a good tight end. I got him on my fantasy team. I hope he stays healthy. Dime a dozen, dude, right? Six foot five, not that great looking. What does he have? Four, maybe five years at the most left in his career. And then what? He can do a podcast? Okay, sure. That's fine. I don't have anything against Travis Kelsey. I think he's very talented. I think he's a dime a dozen for Taylor Swift. Like, Taylor Swift is going to be worth $50 billion. There are like a million dudes that she could end up with that are successful. In five years, Travis Kelsey's career will have officially peaked. It may have already peaked. In five years, Taylor Swift's going to be every bit as famous as she is now. Heck, if she's still alive, in 50 years, she could still be just as popular. Mick Jagger's still out there on the stage. There's no reason she couldn't continue to... uh, The Rolling Stones still tour and sell out stadiums. There's no reason Taylor Swift couldn't be selling out stadiums in 50 years if she's still alive and healthy enough to do it. Travis Kelsey's going to be done in four years. Nobody's going to care about him in any football stadium in America in four years. She could do better. Now, maybe she loves him. Maybe it's true love. Maybe they're meant to be together, and if that's true, more power to her. She can pick anybody on the planet. But if I were assessing the relative benefits of a Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey, or uh, relationship, Travis Kelsey gains way more by being with Taylor Swift than Taylor Swift gains by being with Travis Kelsey. There's your relationship advice for the day. DBAP, unless you need to SBAP. I am Clay Travis, and this has been OutKick, the show.